the volume up? Oh, really? Okay. It's already up. Hello. There we go. Testing. Hello. Hello. You guys ready? I'm speaking into a microphone not because I don't think you can hear me. I'm speaking into a microphone. I'm speaking into a microphone to get your attention. Um, and it works, as it turns out. And then also, because we're having a live stream tonight, um, so there, well, as soon as people get the URL tweeted and uh, pushed out via Facebook, et cetera, and put on the Meetup page, we will have people online also watching us. So that's why we're gonna be speaking into the microphone when we ask questions so everybody can follow. Because we are an online community meetup, not an on-the-ground community meetup, so we try to do things online, as it turns out. So um, what you see right here is a back channel. Uh, we have these, for the, new, for the newcomers in the room, we have these every single time so that we can amplify the conversation beyond the room. So if you would like to be featured in that back channel and also communicate what you're saying with the Twitter sphere outside of the room, use the hashtag OC tribe for online community tribe. Uh, I am Susan Tenby and you are in TechSoup. For those of you that don't know, uh, TechSoup is a nonprofit, San Francisco based nonprofit. We uh, were founded in 1987. I'm pointing back there at the wall or history, wall of shame kind of thing. Um, previously known as CompuMentor, uh, we were a mentor matching nonprofit, uh, matching tech mentors with, nonpro uh, with nonprofit organizations. And then we became TechSoup in 2000, and I've actually been at this organization since we launched as TechSoup, since 2000. Uh, mainly doing online community the entire time, uh, all the way through all the different forums, um, our, our fora, uh, our listservs, all the different forms of online community um, I've launched and tried and started and done the strategy for here at this organization. So it's been quite, quite a learning experience. Uh, I am now in a new division of TechSoup called Caravan Studios. Uh, Caravan Studios is an entrepreneurship as opposed to an entrepreneurship within TechSoup, and Caravan Studios um, focuses on app development for nonprofits. Not specific apps for specific orgs, but more apps that focus on vertical mission focus, like domestic violence organizations, or food rescue groups, or pet rescue groups, or emergency response groups human trafficking organizations. So you see a sign right there that's strategically placed to prevent you from walking in the back portion of the office. That sign says Safe Night, and that is our first app. It's in the marketplace. Uh, it will be in iOS. It's right now in uh, Windows and uh, Android, Google Play. But it will be in iOS, I think, starting next week. And that is an app to help crowdfund hotel rooms for victims of um, domestic violence when there are no available shelter beds. Right now, this is a system that domestic violence agencies use, but um, they have to pay out of their own pockets, and with budget cuts, it's very difficult. So Safe Night uh, is a crowdfunding app for that specific purpose. Purpose, And what makes Caravan unique is that, um, unlike a lot of hackathons that we went to, we don't just build apps because we think they're cool. We actually find out the specific need from the nonprofits. So that's what we did, and that's how we found out that, because we talked to a lot of domestic violence agencies. Uh, but we are here today to talk about online community with Megan from Twilio. And um, before we get started, I wanted to open uh, the room to job announcements. Does anybody have a job announcement that they want to share? Yes. And Anthony. Or you can just say it in the room because I don't even know if the live stream has audience yet. And I uh, tweeted it out uh, earlier and put it on the Facebook group. Oh, and if you are not uh, registered on this meetup group, please go to meetup.com slash OC tribe. And you can also join our Facebook group, which is San Francisco Online Community Meetup Group on Facebook. And so we post job announcements there. Um, and we use the hashtag OC tribe to post job announcements. This um, board right here is all of the Twitter accounts. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mark.
And um, yes? Oh, oh God. Yes. Um, I'm with um, Publishing Okay, and um, also you guys remember to uh, tweet those out and use the hashtag and post them uh, so that they get, and you can also email, uh, you can email them to the meetup group as long as you check in with me first, just because I, I don't want people spamming that list, so, like Anthony did. The hashtag OC Tribe. But you can also just email me, I'm the face on the meetup page and I will post it for you, or either way. Um, and uh, I wanted to um, mention our volunteers who are listed on this, uh, white sheet. Uh, we have the hashtag, we have TechSoup, we have Megan, our speaker, Twilio, me, I'm Suze Boop, Susan Chavez, give it up, volunteer since the beginning, that girl Crystal, that's that girl Crystal, uh, Regina Walton, yay, uh, Time Doctor, who's not here right now, but it's Zach, the redhead guy, he's really awesome, uh, Rav Kili, who is Ravi, right there, <laughs> and he's the door guy, super sweet. Um, in our volunteer corps. And SCAD is Matt Fairchild. He's also not here, uh, but he says he will be here next time and he's sorry. Scott Moore is a volunteer. Uh, Mark is a volunteer right there. So thank you to the volunteers. Mark Siegel's a volunteer. Um, we have a great group of volunteers, so thank you. This is a volunteer run group. This is a group that is only housed in TechSoup, but is not, a, this is, my gig, this is not a, this is a volunteer run group, so thank you. And thank you to Twilio for sponsoring the food. And thank you to the Iron Cactus and the Creamery for sponsoring the chips and salsa, every, every time. Uh, okay, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Megan. I'm really excited for this, uh, for this talk. And um, after she, um, it's up to you, do you wanna break for Q&A after, or do you want people to interject? After is probably it less throat doesn't throw you off. I'm I'm the same way. So um, hold your Q and A for after. You can tweet them and we can read them, and then uh, we'll have some schmoozing and then we'll be out the door by nine. Sounds good. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Susan. Oh, let me make sure I don't knock things over. Can go wireless. Test test test. Awesome. Turn this guy on. Hey, everybody. I am super excited to be here tonight and share with you some of my experiences um, managing developer communities and sharing some pro tips that hopefully you can take back to your own communities as well. Uh, so I'm the senior community manager at Twilio. Um, who is familiar with Twilio? Whoa, that's awesome. OK, great. So we're a platform for developers to build voice and text messaging into any web or mobile app. Uh, if you've used Uber or Lyft, you get that text message, that's powered by us. Uh, I also drive our social good initiative, which we call Twilio.org, working with nonprofits to help them gain access to communications technologies and kind of power their objectives. So we're gonna talk about developer communities. Um, again, just highlighting some, some pro tips that I've learned in my past couple years at Twilio, specifically. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna look at who a developer really is. Uh, don't know here if anyone's had experience within developer communities. Hands up, sort of, yes. Okay, good, yeah, great. Um, what does that community look like? Uh, what's the best way to engage with that community? And then of course, building, nurturing, and expanding that community. So, developer. Um, when you use the term developer or programmer, a lot of times this is the stereotype that people conjure up in their mind. Um, we don't want to perpetuate this stereotype anymore because it's just not true. This is much more representative of what the developer community looks like. Um, it's corporate, it's hackers, it's students, it's professionals, uh, a range of ages. There are women in the developer community, yes, uh, you may have heard that UC Berkeley uh, recently just had more women 
then men enroll in an introductory computer science class. That's awesome. Uh, and that's really showing the evolution of this community. So I wanted to share a couple stats, again, just to kind of help frame the community that we're talking about. So the Evans Group did a survey last year, developers, self-identified developers around the world. Um, this was really interesting to me because they asked them to describe their job. Of course, programmers, engineers, but look at the range of these job descriptions. Web designer, CEO, program manager, product manager. Um, these are all people that identify themselves as developers. They code in their everyday job, um, but it's not you know, specific to one role. Um, the one thing that all these folks have in common is they're solving problems every day. The age range, another really interesting stereotype that we have in Silicon Valley of a developer. Do you think young, male, maybe a college grad, maybe a college dropout? Um, just under six million of self-identified developers in this survey are under the age of 30. There's over 12 million that are between the age of 30 and 60 plus. Free time. Um, this struck me as really interesting when looking kind of through the survey data. Um, just under 50% of developers are building things in their free time. So they're really passionate about what they do. It's not just their job, it's a lifestyle. And it's something to keep in mind when you're engaging with your developer community. So we understand what this community looks like. What's the best way to speak to them? What's the best way to engage with them? First and foremost, be authentic. Yes, it's kind of a buzzword. We get it. You should be authentic. But really, be genuine. And frankly, cut the BS. Cut the marketing fluff. They don't have time for it. They're not going to listen. Um, you have to build trust with this community. And the way you do that is by being yourself and truly being authentic. Be a problem solver. Um, developers are solving problems every day in their job. The bug that they're tracking down, that's a problem that they're going to solve. The solution that they have to build for their company, they're approaching that as a problem. Uh, I would say also just in life, developers approach life um, through this problem solving mentality. So when you're engaging with them, clearly state how you can help solve their problem, how you can help them approach the challenges that they have uh, and find a solution. Know your trolls. Uh, this community is really direct. Uh, if they don't like what you're doing in your product, they'll let you know. If you don't like the way that you're speaking, there's, that you're speaking to them, they'll let you know. They might let you know loudly. They might use all caps. They might use a series of tweets. Um, but this is awesome to have a community that's gonna be totally honest and direct with you and let you know what you're doing wrong and what you can do better. Listen, really important. Um, this is a room of community managers though and I think we can all spot a real troll when we see one. So of course, always remember the first rule of the internet, which is don't feed the trolls. I saw someone in the back saying it. Um, so we understand the landscape a little bit better about the community. Um, we've got some, some best practices in terms of engagement. So where do you go to start really building this community? I, I couldn't find an image for this slide, so we're going to go with Hanson. Um, <laughs> so this community is really not reached on normal marketing channels. Um, again, we're all community managers, so we know that to reach a new community, to build a new community, you have to go to where they are. Um, but it's super, super important to just remember to be authentic. Get to know what their challenges are. Get to know uh, the problems they encounter and how they're thinking about solving them. That's where you're gonna build trust. Uh, and that's where they're gonna let you in to those communities and you'll truly reach them. A really good example of this uh, is with a company called Keen.io. Is anybody familiar with them? 
Yeah, they, uh, they have an analytics API for developers. So they were promoting the fact that they were happy to sponsor beer and pizza for any developer that wanted to host a meetup. Um, they could have tweeted it, they could have posted it on a blog, they could have thrown up a form and asked a developer to go to a form and then fill out the thing and then get an email. They didn't do that. Uh, they posted this on GitHub. GitHub is a collaborative coding platform. Uh, and then for a developer to say, hey, I want to host a meetup, they had to uh, submit a pull request, which essentially is a code change in this platform. That's awesome. They didn't ask the developer to go somewhere else, another page, another site, another communication channel. They went straight to where they're spending their time. They asked them to do something that's totally in their day-to-day -day habits. Uh, so keep that in mind. Make sure you're giving them the tools to succeed. Uh, developers are, are, are sharp. They're building things. They know what they want to achieve. So from a product standpoint, give them sample code. Give them awesome documentation. Um, inspire them by creating tutorials to help them figure out what they can build. From a content marketing perspective, tech technical content is killer. Uh, it's killer for raising awareness. It's killer for connecting with developers. And not just for the obvious reasons. Not just because you're helping them build something, but you're truly sharing knowledge and you're inviting them to be a part of that and then you're solving these problems together. Once you've given them the tools to succeed, get out of the way. Don't block them. Um, make them the Heisman. Let them run and be successful. Uh, from a product standpoint, be transparent. Make the trial really easy and accessible. Uh, make it really easy to sign up and, and start building. Um, give them the tools and get out of the way and give them a clear path to success. At this point, you really want to think about, you've started to build your community, you're engaging with them, you really want to think about how you can best help them be successful. So you want to focus on them. Again, this is our job, right? We're community managers. This is what we think about every day. This is probably what we fight for inside of our own companies. Remember the user. Um, this is innate for us. Uh, when you get to this point, though, you may have competitors poaching your community members. If you've done your job up until now, you've built the trust, um, you've become a part of the community, you're sharing knowledge, you're working together to solve problems, you're okay. Don't get distracted uh, because developers are loyal and they don't really care about brand battles. Um, in the end, continue to focus on making your user and your community members successful and that in itself fuels growth. Always remembering that loyalty goes both ways. Again, focus on your user for the long term. Um, this community can be distrustful, but for good reason. Uh, uh, you may recall that Twitter had an API once. They released this platform, this API, they invited developers to come be a part of it. Developers built apps, people built businesses around it, boom, gone. Just kidding, we're done. We're taking that away. Um, don't do that, that's bad. Um, <laughs> that is forgetting uh, about your user. Um, you know, this community, they, they want to know and respect their partners and their problem-solving quests. So, loyalty goes both ways. And really listen, really listen. Um, especially in the beginning when you're building out this community, because again, developers are going to tell you what they like and what they don't like, and what they need and what they don't need. So really listen to them. Um, and let them know that you're listening. Let them know the impact that they have on your product, because uh, that will truly build a partnership. And that's really what you want with this community. Um, it'll, really, it'll really build loyalty. Uh, again, and continue to fuel growth because you're starting to build um, true heroes in your community. 
So how do you take all these things and scale? How do you scale your efforts and utilize your community to then continue to grow that community? Uh, as I just mentioned, building heroes. Um, there are some developers that you're probably aware of because they're, they're really put up on pedestals as rock stars, right? Zuckerberg, uh, Cliff Bozinski, who is the lead game developer for Gears of War. Man, so much publicity, so much spotlight. There's a lot of developers that worked on those products that we don't know about. We have an opportunity as community managers to recognize these developers, recognize their efforts, and give them a little love, give them a little spotlight. Um, at Twilio, we, we have our blog. We interview developers every week. We ask them who they are, what are they building, how are they approaching these challenges. And we don't put a company logo on that blog post. We put their headshot. We show their face. We show the team. Um, again, build these heroes in your community because uh, it builds that trust. Um, and they, they really appreciate it. And in the long run, that's what we're here to do. We're here to recognize the awesome stuff that our community is doing. Don't be afraid to empower your community, especially developers. Um, you give them the tools to succeed and they're gonna go do amazing things. Um, your first thought should always be, how do I empower my developer community to go change the world? Because in the end, if you've empowered them to do amazing things with your product, by default, you've empowered them to be a brand ambassador, essentially. Um, we have a program that we just launched at Twilio that we call the Heroes Program. It walks uh, participants through a series of soft skills. So learn how to write technical content, learn how to project manage, learn how to plan an event. We're investing in these community members not to encourage them to learn everything they can about Twilio, but just encourage them to be a more well-rounded developer and essentially put them on this path to be a developer evangelist. Um, this is, this is not being scared to empower your community with skills to go change the world. Uh, and again, in the long run, because you're being authentic, you're teaching them to be better developers, that builds that relationship and it will empower them to be brand ambassadors for your company. Because in the end, this is what we wanna do, right? As community managers, we wanna create champions. Um, you build them, Build a hero, empower them, get out of the way, and let them change the world. Uh, we have a track jacket at Twilio. You may have seen these red track jackets around. When you're a new Twilio employee, you have to build an app, whether you can code or not. You build the app, you receive your track jacket. Achievement unlocked. Uh, if you're a community member to receive one of these track jackets, you have to build something with Twilio uh, and just do something awesome. Make an impact. You know, this track jacket exemplifies the Twilio company values. Uh, and in the community, it represents a level of expertise. So I'm just gonna brag a little bit about some of our community champions, because they're awesome. Uh, Patrick McKenzie here on the right, he's one of our first customers. He built an entire business around Twilio. Um, he started speaking at events about Twilio. He'd always wear his track jacket. Then he started speaking at events not about Twilio, but he still wore his Twilio track jacket. He's a true champion. Uh, Eva Zhang in the middle, I met her when she was 17. She came to San Francisco, spend the summer here, learn how to code, she started just killing it at hackathons. She started winning hackathons, sometimes with Twilio, sometimes with, without. She just became such an awesome champion in the community. We invited her to come be a mentor and a teacher at our user conference this past year. And she's now part of the Heroes program. So again, just empowering her to take over the world. You build a friend and you build a loyal community champion. Uh, and then finally, Ricky Robinette, who's actually an employee now, so I guess some of these can be used for recruiting tactics. 
Um, also, Early Customer built this incredible app that went viral, got on the Today Show. He is just an incredible developer and an incredible human being uh, and a wonderful champion. So this is our end goal, right? And if you do all those things, you connect, you engage, you empower them, this is, this is the byproduct. So in summary, make sure you're engaging authentically, the problem-solving mentality. Um, Know your trolls, but love your trolls. They're trolling because they love you. Uh, <laughs> go to where they are. Give them the tools to succeed. Get out of the way. Um, always focus on your user. Remember that loyalty goes both ways, and there shouldn't be an end to that loyalty. Uh, and listen. Listen well, listen closely, and let them know that you're listening. And then build those heroes. Again, empower them, and in the end, you'll create true champions in your community. And that's all I got, guys. Thanks. I will run the mic around because we have people on the live stream so they can hear the questions and answers. Thank you, that was a great talk. And I actually um, totally subscribe to everything you're saying. I, you're, you got it, you're right on. Uh, and it was really interesting. Uh, who has, wow, it's really hot and loud. Who has questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Jenny Graham Scott. I um, wondered how you, uh, some examples of some of the apps that people have created, and then once they're developed, how do you promote the app or get them out there and get publicity for it and get it into the marketplace? Yeah, absolutely, Ms. Um One of the coolest and most impactful apps that I've seen recently is called Nomo Robo. So it was uh, an app built by a single developer for an FTC challenge for fighting robocallers, powered by Twilio. Um, I can't actually tell you exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. Lauren, I don't know. <laughs> it works well enough that it won the contest. Um, it stops the calls. It stops the calls. So. You know, something like this is, is so impactful. A single developer built this using an API and some other tools. And, you know, we hear about things in a lot of different ways. Uh, they come through Twitter. Sometimes folks will just email us. They'll email support. They'll email directly, you know, whatever. It comes in through these different channels. Um, we're lucky enough at Twilio that we have a lot of different communication platforms uh, to promote these things. It's a pretty low barrier for us. So we love to share people's stories. Um, we immediately get them in the queue, interview them to just learn about what they're doing, get them on the blog, newsletter. Um, if we feel like there's an opportunity for PR, for open the PR folks, um, we have such an incredible community that the stories kind of develop themselves. Um, we just always try to stay on top of it in terms of understanding what our community is building. And I think that's just, that's where you start. Once you know what they're doing, you can take it and run with it. Do you get percentages or payments for the apps you know, when they get out there? So the way the platform works is it's pay per use. So they sign up, it's three fourths of a cent per message, text message, that sort of thing. Um, though, you know, again, when we see someone building something, perhaps it's an independent developer, perhaps it's a side project and it starts taking off, we always offer to support them. If it's something they believe in, it's something that makes sense, then sure, we'll help you get this out there and, and help you grow it. Yeah. Hi, can you talk a little bit about um, how you um, give tools to your community? So for us, uh, the tools tend to be clear information and um, just support and knowledge. So for us, the tools are really, really thorough documentation, um, making sure they have the support when they run into an issue. Awesome people like Lauren help them walk through um, building apps and that sort of thing. Um, you know, again, when it comes to them an independent developer and they're looking for support, we can provide them with credits, we can provide them with 
publicity and promotional support. Um, from a content perspective, it's, it's thinking about what challenges they might run into uh, ahead of time and then creating that content to support that. Is there an editorial calendar or proactive, like these are the 12 things that we're going to put documentation out there about? Is, do it's you approach mix. it from that way? Partially, yes. Um, I, it's, I would say it's half proactive and it's half reactive, right? And it really depends on, you know, we have a different team that really handles documentation and FAQs and then you know, we have a team focused on more editorial types of content. So I would say we, we look at the trends, we look at what our community is doing, and we plan as much as we can. We plan around product, but half the time it's reactive too. If someone's doing something so cool, yeah, we'll, we'll move the editorial calendar aside to, to get the word out. Question for you. Um, how difficult in your mind is it for somebody who's non-technical to be a community manager for developers? And if so, what are some ways that they can best communicate with this highly technical audience? Good question, Lauren. Um, my background was not technical. And I still wouldn't really, I don't consider myself a developer. I can code a little bit. I can do some front end. I built my Twilio app. When I came to Twilio, uh, I definitely had to sell myself to the company <laughs> to get the job. Um, but as soon as I started, I realized very quickly, and you know, as I was talking about go to where this community is and get to know what their challenges are, I spent a lot of time learning to code. I went to a lot of workshops. I really wanted to understand um, not just our own product, but that problem-solving mindset, the problems that they might run into. So I would definitely recommend if you're a non-technical person, go ahead and, and just be ready to commit to learning. Uh, be ready to commit to understanding what this community is all about, because you can't fake it. Smell it on you. Be like, you don't, you don't get what I'm talking about. So yeah, you definitely got to commit and learn. Hey. How, how do you measure the health of this community, kind of month to month? And what is the single thing you're doing right now to improve that health, that metric? What a good question. Um, yes. <laughs> what a scary question to answer. You know, there's not you know, obviously one thing to do to measure the health of a community. It's a variety of things. It's looking at what's going on in, in the support world. What's going on? What problems are they running into? We have a large team of developer evangelists that are on the ground going to events and engaging with developers on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what are the trends that they're seeing? What's, what's the ROI that they're seeing from a field marketing perspective? Um, from an online community perspective, what's the engagement like online? What's the conversations about? You know, for us at Twilio, we're an online platform. We're an API, so when it comes to measuring the health of our users, it's, you know, it's pretty related to leads and usage and, and that sort of thing. When it comes to community, it gets a little fuzzy, as I'm sure most of us are used to. Um, so that doesn't really answer your question. I would just say there's a lot of different variables uh, that we're looking at in terms of health. Can you, can you clarify, what's the difference at Twilio between a, dev a developer evangelist and a community manager? Sure, so I can tell you specific to Twilio, what we focus on. Uh, our evangelists, they are thought leaders in the development community. They're developers, they're programmers. Um, they know their stuff. So they write a lot of the technical content. They are in the field, they're at hackathons, they're working with you know, larger corporations, with their innovation departments. So they kind of take that technical thought leader role. Uh, community, the community team at Twilio is focused on the online communities, social, stack overflow, management, um, customer and community content. So when we're talking about use cases and we're interviewing developers, kind of those softer uh, editorial pieces. Um, and then local events, engagement, and programs like the Heroes program that I mentioned, more programmatic, nurturing types of things. Um, 
yeah. I'm going to ask a question from the Twitter screen, uh, stream. This is from at PeopleFW, otherwise known as Lynn Abati Johnson. Okay. Uh, she says, it just scrolled, sorry. She asks, a uh, question from the North Bay. Where did it go? Megan, how does one create an app if they can't write, or if they don't write code? So I, I'm guessing she's referring to if you join Twilio and you don't know how to code, how the hell do you figure that out? Um, well, I mean, we try to make our product as easy to understand as possible. APIs are fun for this reason, because uh, they're accessible. That said, it's good to buddy up with the coder. Uh, we have code coaching every week at Twilio. People get together, they stay late on Mondays, and they build stuff. Uh, so it's a process, right? Again, you're, you're committing to building something. You're committing to learning. Um, it's not always easy, but it's fun. And man, when you code something and your phone rings, it's really cool. Over here. Hi. Uh, two questions. One is, how did you pick who your heroes are? That'll be, and I'll wait for that one. On specifically the, so you, you meant, I think it was heroes, where you mentioned like you're training them on project management and some of those kinds oh. of things. Is that the heroes or is that Yes, that's the heroes program. So how are you picking which of your developers? I can imagine that you have a lot, so I can't, I don't imagine that that's, you can't send them all through there. Right, exactly. And this, we just launched this program this year. Um, we, we did an application process. So the age range is college to recent college grads. Um, so we're looking for people that are, one, committed to learning this stuff. Um, you know, any examples that they may have already started doing some of these things. Uh, it was kind of your normal application process. It was not easy. Uh, to Mo yeah. Most of them had built something on Twilio already. That was kind of the... Uh, I don't believe it was a requirement. But if, you're, if you hear about this HEROES program, we weren't reaching outside of our community to look for these folks. It was definitely inside of our community. So they were familiar with Twilio, and they're interested in connecting with us and, and learning what they can from our team. OK, and then the not at all related question. So did, have they taken any of your projects that you've built as an employee and spun them out? Not mine personally. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, so that's interesting. We have an internal innovation week at Twilio, and sometimes those projects are spun out into real products. Um, when thinking about new employee apps, there was one that went super viral. It was called Call and Oats. It was like on NPR, you could dial, Call and Oats on demand. I wouldn't say we spun that out on purpose, but definitely went viral. Okay attention. It was just an employee's app. Okay. Um, when somebody finished an app, uh, you talked about the robo stop as an example. Um, do these end up, you know, the ones that are really good end up like on Apple or Samsung or someplace, and then if people download them, is the developer or the Twilio get a percentage, or how does that all that work? So it really depends. So people building with Twilio are, are implementing voice calls or text messaging into anything. So it could be an app that they submit to the app store. Uber or Lyft is a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, or they could be building out entire call centers powered by our voice and messaging. Um, we're always going to be paid per use. So we don't necessarily take a cut or negotiate anything like that. It's very straightforward. You use this much Twilio, it costs this much, and then it's kind of up to them what they do with that product. Well, is the customer paying um, for this? I mean, the, like the person who downloads it from uh, from Apple, or it all depends on what the Twilio customer builds and how they present that to their users. So, so the developers are considered the customers in your in your discussion, not not the person who's use, using the app. Is that? Correct, yes. Oh, okay, because I was a little confused about that. Um, so are all your apps related around calling and text messaging, or would somebody build an app that does something different? 
We have a lot of customers that build a range of apps, but the one thread for us, because what we provide is, is voice or text messaging. So that's, that's consistent. Uh, and then whatever our developer builds on the other end, they could add a web app, they could um, just build out entire companies around it, and just a piece could be yeah. voice or I mean, messaging. a thing that just comes to mind is like a GPS kind of a, a, a location thing, which isn't really maybe voice or text messaging. And if, if somebody develops that, would that be like on their own time or? Sure, I mean, someone could build a GPS powered locator, and if it came into a certain area, then they could send a text message to someone else, and that, that piece would be Twilio powered. But oh. They essentially have built something around it. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Other community management related questions versus Twilio tech questions? I'd just, um, is there other, other questions in the house? Oh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, so what, what do you think about rewarding? Because um, I mean, I never, what is that noise? Okay, I got scared. <laughs> um, what is, uh, I've never managed a community of developers. And I know that the, it's a very kind of, it's a different kind of community. I, I generally manage communities that are transactional question and answer communities of nonprofits. They're not, it's, they, they come there because they want something. Uh, what do you think is the main motivator? Because um, I know it's not getting a jacket. I mean, a jacket's cool, but like what keeps them there? And like the ones that are the long term, what are the main motivators and reasons that they say they want to join and, and continue once they achieve a level of success that you've given to them? <laughs> the jackets. The jacket. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's one single motivator. What are the main ones? I think the really, as I mentioned before, when you're a developer and you're you're trying to solve a problem, you're trying to figure out how to build some sort of solution. Um, you want to make sure that you're choosing technology partners that you can trust. Um, they're going to provide the right support. They're going to listen to what you're saying. You know, they want to feel like they're engaging with someone that's going to help them on their quest to solve this problem. So I think it's done in a variety of ways. Um, you know, a lot of what we talked about, all those elements come together. Um, it's really creating friends within the community uh, and working together. And a lot of times that's, our evangelists will sit down and help someone build an entire app, even if it, they're not using Twilio. That says a lot about who they are, and it says a lot about the developer community. And that developer may not use Twilio today, but they're going to remember that we help them reach a goal. And I think that motivates them. And that's why we have a lot of loyal customers, because we listen and we take care of our folks. Do you have any, uh, any success stories with the nonprofits yet? A few. This has been a really exciting initiative for me. Uh, because I am not also not familiar with the nonprofit world. I've been learning a lot, um, thanks to some good conversations with Susan as well. Uh, I think one of the most successful, uh, most well, not successful, I would say the most impactful thing that we've seen from that program um, was a pretty, pretty big effort that we worked with uh, Polaris Project last year. Um, Polaris Project um, runs the main uh, hotline, the 1-800 hotline for human trafficking victims. So they're, uh, we're actually partnering with them to, um, this wasn't a softball, but I'm gonna use it as a, as a way to pitch what we're doing. Uh, so the Safe Night app, uh, we are finalists in the Humanity United Partnership for Freedom Reimagine Opportunity Challenge. That's the name of it, it's really long. Um, and we're partnered with Polaris. Um, and if we win, we get a million dollars and get to build the Safe Night way out for human trafficking victims. So anyway. Awesome. So you worked with Polaris. Yes. That's exciting now, actually. Uh, huh. Erica told me about that. That's exciting. Um, so they wanted to figure out a way to utilize text messaging, because it's not safe for, for victims of human trafficking to make phone calls. It's really dangerous. Um, we teamed up with Salesforce and Thorne, which is Ashton Kutcher and Demi's, Demi Moore's group um, that helps uh, fight child exploitation with technology. So we donated a short code, which is the five-digit number, uh, 
and so they could promote that as a channel of communication for victims to ask for help. And it ended up being very successful within that community um, to the point where there's a story where a single text message actually saved a girl that was, I think, under 18. She sent out a message for help, and, and within a couple hours, we, not we, Polaris, got in there and, and got her out. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, and that's, that's all we're trying to do with .org, is work with organizations who are interested in, in implementing technologies, just help them use it. And you know, we'll be, on Caravan, we'll be working with Twilio.org, so yeah, a lot. Uh, other questions? Last chance, last call. Any other questions? Any questions from the virtual? Um, the Twitter fall, we're gonna, don't tweet this. Twitter fall sucks, and TweetBeam also sucks. So we're now gonna be trying to find another tool that does this, but actually refreshes itself, because it's really lame that I have to keep manually refreshing it. So if you guys, if anybody wants to tweet out to me, or just email me what they think instead um, of those two options, that'd be awesome. Uh, but anyway, from, from people who are actually manually refreshing the OC Tribe handle, are there any questions coming in? Yeah, nope. There, there's just that one from Lynn. The one from Lynn. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Susan at caravanstudios.org or Susan at techsoup.org. Or just go to the meetup.com site and where it has my face, you can just contact me right there. Caravanstudios.org. And I'm at Suze Boop on Twitter. All right. Thank you so much to Megan Murphy who is a Thanks wonderful speaker and a really interesting, smart person. And thank you all for coming. And next month, which will also be the fourth Wednesday um, of the month, the meetup will be, we have Crystal talking about uh, communities, um, how do you describe? Managing big changes at Ning or just in general in communities? Okay, so that girl Crystal, she's awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. Hang out for a while.